Welcome to the business on Radio Verulam, the voice of your local business community. Hello, it's Sunday. It's um, it's 8 p.m. and yes, welcome to the business. Um, I'm Trevor Meriden with the show that's essential listening for the West Hearts business community. Um, our show is always packed with delights, so and no more so than this evening. We're very excited to have uh, Joanna Michaelidis, um, the founder of Just Puddings, the St Albans destination for anyone with a sweet tooth uh, or a party to organise. She'll be talking to us about her business life. Um, a survey out this week shows that CEOs don't get the uh, link between engagement and the bottom line. So is engagement fluffy nonsense or route one to profits? And then we'll be asking our panel that question and others. Um, Joanna uh, will be joined by Alex Schubert from Wenta and Claire McEnulty from Compact Video. And what's the point of a great website if no one knows you're there? We've got the first of a two-part interview with Tom Jepson, head of SEO at High Position, on how to get noticed. Um, that's all to come, plus our diary planner, of course. But of course, I've got my partners in crime in the studio. I've got uh, Vicky Scott and Claire McAnulty. Good evening. Hello. And, um, and uh, Father's Day. <laughs> yes, <that's right. laughs> it is Father's Day. Yes. Uh, and um, thank you very, thank you very much. I had a lovely day. Thank you to Freddie, Ollie, and Arthur. I just thought I'd get that in. Um, <laughs> what's been uh, catching your attention in the news, Vicky? Um, well, I can't let the business news go by without some comment about the resignation of um, a very good friend of mine, Paul Tucker from the Bank of England. It's not only because I want to name drop, but really it's because I couldn't believe the response. I was reading the Financial Times on Saturday and I quote, Mr Tucker announced his news to the stunned chief executives of the banks at their regular Monday morning meeting. Now, this man has been at the Bank of England all his life. He's been hotly tipped to be governor of the Bank of England for the last two years, let alone the last decade. So why on earth would anyone be surprised that shortly after he didn't get the job that he'd wanted all his life, he resigned? The point is not at all about Paul. It's about looking after your staff, retention, awareness and succession planning. If you're managing people well, nothing should ever be a shock. Everyone knows where there is hierarchy and sorry everyone knows where they are if you have a hierarchy and their progression possibilities and then gaping holes don't appear when people move on knowing what's going on is far far better for the employer and the employee and we know from many many interviews that we've had on this show that the happier the staff are um, the better the business Um, so Please, please, all those businesses out there, don't be surprised um, that when somebody leaves after a few years, just make sure that you've got some form of appraisal system. Be ready. It might seem yes. like a pain to a small business, but if it's done properly, it really does mean that companies don't carry unproductive staff, they don't carry uncooperative staff, and actually you don't find yourself suddenly losing your best salesperson because you haven't looked after them properly. Eminent common sense. I think that I think is so. absolutely, <laughs> absolutely right. And, and it does it astonishes me that people are astonished as well i mean it's, it, it's, it's just one of those things i mean this week it's paul tucker tomorrow it'll be somebody else Absolutely. you know what are we to do how will we find you know a football manager a a, a chief executive a, a, an almost anything and you know good business people plan with and those it, things in mind it, it, and it doesn't matter whether it's a small business where there's but it's probably even more important if it's a small business and there's only three or four of you you know losing a quarter of the sales force all of a sudden can be devastating yeah. but you know the fact that it happens in big business as well is is just appalling really yeah, and uh, Claire, what, what's um, what's caught your eye? Well, probably slightly slightly more mundane compared to to Vicky's. Um, a, a news that caught my eye this week was 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 a story about telephone boxes or the or the <laughs> lack of them. Right. Um, now, the reason I noticed this story was because I, I was on a Scottish island last summer and the mobile signal wasn't good. So we ended up using one of the red telephone boxes to make calls. And I remember thinking at the time that I hadn't actually used one of these pay phones for, for absolutely years. I'm struggling to think when I when I last would use one, yeah. actually. Yeah. You sort of yeah. see them as decorative ornaments in people's gardens now. That's true, <laughs> yeah, they're sort of at the bottom of a garden. Um, the reason this is news is that BT are increasing their efforts to get rid of many of the old telephone boxes. And although it makes economic sense, a lot of people are not are very unhappy about it. To give you a bit of background, about 10 years ago there were about 92,000 telephone boxes in the UK and that number is now around 58,000, so not not quite half, but getting there. And BT is saying that, that there's only one call a day made from each of these remaining boxes and even less in rural areas. 
And because of this, it simply doesn't make any economic sense for them to maintain the telephone boxes, particularly when they say that 70% of these pay phones are actually losing them money. Mm. But the red telephone boxes in particular are very much liked and, and are promoted everywhere as symbols of the UK. They're, they're quite a tourist yes, attraction. Yes, you see them on those quite little often shops. To buy. That's you right, that's right. In, 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 Leicester, in Leicester Square, you so see that there's, In the press, it's week, a wee bit of a, a public uh, backlash against the removal of these boxes. Um, so, obviously, the, there's sense in keeping the box where there's the, mobile co- the mobile phone coverage is poor. But there is a certain... Um, Although economically it makes sense, there's a certain historical and sort of emotional reason why people want to keep the boxes, really. Um, so I don't know what you think about that. Ah, it's a really, it's a difficult one because it, it doesn't make any sense at all to keep them for the sort of original purpose. To keep them as uh, sort of monuments to British past, I think, is a great idea. My recollection of sort of the, the telephone boxes was they smelt of wee and, <laughs> and they rarely worked and most of the windows had either been kicked in or replaced with nasty plastic material that had mm. been sort of scratched with, you know, Susan loves, loves James or something. Mm. Um, but but the old, you know, the, the, the real ones that they sell in Leicester Square, or, yeah. you know, the charms, um, they're, they're beautiful. So somehow if we could, main, if we could keep them as, as um, like monuments, then that would be lovely. I haven't seen the new Man of Steel than you know, the Superman oh, no, I movie, I, no. but I don't know if he would. He, I mean, would the modern day Superman go into a telephone box <laughs> these days? I mean, I mean with, with, the, with the press yeah. we're giving it at the moment. Yeah. Well, well, yeah. Well, just to finish the story off, if if your village or your town has still got a red telephone box, and uh, you want to keep it. Uh, BT does does have an adoption scheme where you can <laughs> adopt oh, fantastic. the phone box. It will cost you the the, the cost of one pound. Just a pound. To Just adopt. a pound. So you adopt you adopt the red telephone box, and um, that allows you. I think you more or less say that you will look after it, yeah, of course. Yeah. Um, so I've got a horrible feeling your... that there's going to be people snapping them up and then selling them to Americans at huge oh, amounts well, of money. I think, I think yeah. they've got to stay in situ. I think <laughs> they've got to stay in situ. But anyway, if, if you do want to keep your telephone box, just get in touch with BT, ask about their adoption scheme, and, uh, and there you go. It's interesting, isn't it? Because just not, not far from my mother. My mother lives just outside Oxford, um, near the Williams motor, motor racing guys. And there's a, a sort of farm next to that, the Williams place. Hmm. And they must have about 50 phone boxes that started <laughs> gathering there about sort of 15 years ago. Yes. And they've just got, you know, they, they, the, the queue sort of got longer and longer and longer. So they line the drive of this place. <laughs> Very strange. Um so, well, goodness me, they, yeah, they, they might be able to get them back out into the community. Right. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's um, that, that's. The, I mean, I, um, I I I was going to save my keep my powder dry. I think uh, this week, but I do. I'm just going to mention it briefly because I, I, I said something uh, in the start, at the start. A survey by our beloved Ashridge College local um, sort of education establishment, uh, looking at CEOs are still failing to get uh, a connection between engagement and the bottom line. I'm not going to say too much because we're talking about it in our our panel discussion i just found it a very curious story that that what's there not to what's there not to get about it um but i'm going to leave that to our our, our panelists to uh, to talk about having having weighed in with my prejudice um, i do hope that first. um given that i'm not on the panel there'll be enough time at the end of the show for me to have my two penny work well, on that because it it drives me nuts the number of people that don't get it well it, 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 exactly and um we're, we're we're really delighted that we're going to have uh, joanna uh, mike michael edis um from uh, just putting she's already a popular guest and you You'll find out why in uh, in just a few <laughs> seconds time hi this is danny smith join me weekdays from 4 to 7 p.m for west Hearts drive time with features including chris's film club pound saver community notice board calendar artist hot topics and many more besides we also feature correspondents covering topics such as lifestyle consumer advice cooking interior design and travel we have regular interviews, local news and sports, celebrity birthdays, travel and traffic updates and competitions as well. That's all on West Hearts Drive Time with me, Danny Smith, on 92.6 FM, Radio Verulam. Radio Verulam Community Partners. The St Albans District Talking Newspaper is a local charity which offers a free news service to people who are visually impaired. 
News is taken from the Hearts Advertiser and is read and recorded onto cassette tapes and memory sticks, which are sent out each week. If you know someone who is visually impaired who might be interested, please ring Linda Randall on 01582 832275 for more information. For more on Radio Verulam Community Partners, go to radioverulam.com slash community partners. You're listening to The Business on Radio Verulam. We're the voice of the local business community on 92.6 FM and on radioverulam.com. Well, I'm delighted to introduce Joanna McLeedies, who's the founder of Just Puddings, the St Albans destination, as we said, if you have a sweet tooth, a party to organise, or an event that needs a centrepiece. And Joanna is already my favourite guest, because she walked in this evening with the box of the most beautiful little uh, cupcakes that looked um, just so divine. I can't wait for this programme to show to, to finish so they can <laughs> all tuck in. Absolutely exquisite. Do, do we have to wait till the end of the show? Can we not just start <laughs> well, we munching? Do that yeah. sort of, you know, I think it's Test Match Special where they eat cake halfway yeah, through. Absolutely. <laughs> I'm all for that. Yeah. Um, so, welcome Joanna. It's lovely to have you here. Thank you for having me. Um, baking seems to have made a huge comeback in recent years. Um, the success of the Great British Break Off and Mary Berry and Paul Hollywood, they don't seem to be off the television these days. Um, they've become sort of international stars. It sounded, and I looked on your website obviously before you came along, it sounds as though you've been baking sort of forever. <laughs> yeah, but, really have. <laughs> but how did you decide really to, to, to turn it from a hobby into a business? That was probably more of an accident than an intention. Um, I have two small children and I started making cakes for them for their birthdays. And just through doing that, the comments that I received from other parents and friends kind of prompted me to maybe explore doing it for other people. You were that mother at the school where <laughs> yeah, really everybody was. dreaded their <laughs> yes. cakes being next to yours yeah. on the cake stand. Yeah. I think it was also just, um, well, again, it was a hobby, but it was also a passion of mine. So then I was kind of channeling all my energy into that. And so, yeah, I got a bit carried away probably. But did you, because you, you, you mentioned on the website that you were part of the legal profession. That's yes. a big profession to be giving up um, to bake cakes. I mean... I there can was a few absolutely steps in understand why. <laughs> so what were the steps in between? Well, the children came okay, along and okay. uh, we, yeah. So had you decided you weren't going to go back? Correct, yeah. Okay. I decided at that point that I would stay at home to raise the children. And then it was from there that I decided that maybe having a little hobby on the side would be so good what, for everyone. What, when did you sell your first cake and who did you sell it to and how did it feel? <laughs> yeah, it was amazing, actually. Um, it was a friend of mine, and it was another mum at the school, and it was for her son's, I believe it was his fourth birthday. And, uh, yeah, no, it was really good. It was really satisfying, um, but equally nerve-wracking, I think, because it's very different when you make it just for friends in a very casual environment, but when someone's actually paying you money, mm. then all of a sudden you notice every mistake. And, and how do you take it from one cake to one friend to a business where you're actually... Um, m you know, making good profit, and you're, you're living. You know, you're living off the profit to a certain uh, yeah, extent. Yeah, no, that's been purely by word of mouth. I think that's the thing with cake business. You can do advertising and you can do promotions, but I think until someone actually tastes your product, um, you're, they're none the wiser. And there's lots of cake companies out there, so it's it's really word of mouth. And do you think, <laughs> you know, what, what, why was there a cupcake revolution? Why a renaissance? Why, I mean, what, what happened? What, what, I mean, I can absolutely understand it, tasting them, but, you know, they didn't really exist about five years ago, did they? They didn't over here. Food. I mean, I grew up in America, so ah, they've been around right. for a really, really long time. I mean, they're equally as popular over there now they seem to have had a resur resurgence as well. Mm. Um, but I can remember cupcakes from my childhood. Mm. And what, what, why do you think that was? I think it's the size. I think it's just a really, it's, it fits in their hand, it's easier, it's um, probably neater and tidier as well, rather than having to worry about slicing and handing it out and things like that. So I always used cupcakes for my children, purely for the simplicity of it. Do you think it's something to do with the fact that, you know, when you've got um, cupcakes and they're, they're small and, uh, you know, manageable, that, you know, you, you have a big cake and you, can, you <laughs> cut it off and you say, oh, no, just a little slice for me, please. <laughs> yeah. And actually with a cupcake, I mean, actually, they're quite little anyway, so you don't feel quite so bad, maybe. <laughs> <about having laughs> that some. is true, it's yeah. guilt-free. 
yeah. guilt guilt free. Yeah. No, those ones outside don't look guilt free <laughs> at all. I'm going to calories. I'm going to feel completely and utterly guilt ridden <laughs> and love every minute of it. So, what was the biggest fear about going into business making cakes? I think it's, I guess it's always the fear of failure. You know, just um, disappointing people. Because I think it's again when you're making it as a as a sale, then it's very different. Your, your, your motivation is different. So you just want it to be absolutely perfect at every level. And it's someone's special day. It's either a birthday or a christening or, or a wedding. And then when you start viewing it from that perspective, it's actually absolutely terrifying. Yes, <laughs> Rather yeah. than just me at home making a cake, um, I don't really mind if it's got crumbs or if it doesn't quite look as perfect. But when someone's actually paid you money and they're expecting a result that's very different have there been any disasters yeah, there's been several <laughs> oh, God. and there will tell continue us, to be tell us about well, the one. problem with baking is temperature always affects things so that you know that will never change and it's really hard to accommodate for um but and also uh, roundabouts <laughs> <laughs> delivering cakes is the biggest stress in my business definitely i've just seen actually it says your worst you're in the press saying your worst move was living next to a roundabout yeah, yeah. it's a yeah, major exactly. hazard I've got two roundabouts cakes. right at my exit right. and um yeah no they have yeah if you take it too severely you, they need, slide. you need one of those sort of men in walking <laughs> in front of you like <laughs> yeah. the olden days with the big flag saying <laughs> yeah. coming out with cakes coming out with and, cakes and, and a lot of people really like these kind of 3d character cakes which yeah. look yeah. amazing when they're in my kitchen but then the possibility of error between my kitchen and their house is um now you, you keep mentioning your kitchen is it really your home kitchen it is my home kitchen so your home kitchen is completely taken over it is, so, on most days yeah <laughs> do you still eat cakes at home or there's just too many going out of the oh, front door i mean my children know. definitely still eat cakes i have ironically i don't actually have a sweet tooth I have to say, I'm, I am standing, sitting here in front of, of a very, very slender, <laughs> elegant cake maker. I mean, you, if, you. if there were that many cakes around me, I think I'd just get wider and wider and wider. Well, you, you know, then you're also kind of saturated by it. And it's like, oh, God, if I see another cake. <laughs> but it is practical then to have it running. You're running your business from home. Yeah. And, and that's how it came about was it fit around my children's schedule and I could do it. Um, when they were at school. And is there any temptation to take it out of the kitchen and, and into an external kitchen? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I would certainly, if the opportunity arose, I would look into that. Um, so far, I'm ma managing to do it. I mean, there have been some weekends where it's a bit harried. And do you do, and do you have any staff? Do you do it all yourself? Yeah, I do it all myself. Goodness me. I mean, I do kind of rope in friends and family <laughs> occasionally when it's a really big order. And uh, But yeah, no, it's mainly me. Is that because you've got secret recipes? Is that is, <laughs> is that is that is that the reason that you can't? It. I won't give it. I won't divulge my secrets. Okay, right, right. <laughs> so, what's the next big thing? We've cupcakes have made a renaissance. Baking generally has made a renaissance. Is it, is it is it a seasonal business? Do people eat more cakes in the winter? Or is that just my imagination? Everybody starts sort of knocking no, back. No, I'd no, actually say spring and summer. I, I think really? it's birthdays. It, for me, my business is definitely mainly celebration for, times. Yeah, for birthdays. So it's. So that's, that's, I mean, people have birthdays on babies were born, all so. year. Yeah. And so how, so have you got any big plans beyond the, uh, just the word of mouth? Do you have any big ideas for what, what you're going to do next? Is it to, to actually move out and have your own kitchen? I would love to do that, actually. I mean, it would be really... I think you could just take it to a totally different level. Um, but again, that would require more hours in the day. And um, that's a bit of a challenge this at this stage how, old are the, how old are the children? Uh, six and nine. Okay, so when so they're a little bit bigger, yeah, when they're a little bit bigger. So yeah. I, I think the foundation is definitely there, and um, hopefully, I'm starting to do more and more corporate um, cakes and cupcakes okay. with logos and things like that. Oh, so right. I'm hoping that side of things takes off because then that would be more of a regular income. And mm -hmm. um, I, I hope you don't mind. I've just seen I've just seen a picture of your kids on the website. They look the happiest children <laughs> I, I've ever seen in my life, and they're, they're each of them holding sugar. holding a, a cupcake. <laughs> Um, and uh, very, very, uh, very happy. But quite seriously, though, I mean, like being at home. I mean, I can see it's, it's. You know, I can see why you started the business and home, and you know, and and, uh, and the work life balance. But, but, but actually, I mean, does it does it really get in? The, does it get in the way sometimes? It, it you can, said, yes, yeah, it yeah. can become very stressful because you, you just don't have your space. You know, it is actually my kitchen, so you do have my children coming in and asking me questions, and um, yeah, and trying to again bake in between school runs and things like that is yeah. not um it is, is it, yeah no, i can wise. imagine i can imagine it adds to the enormous stress of well, and i like to 
have my cakes as fresh as possible. So then yeah. you're, you're, I'm always seem to be down to the wire in terms of timescales. Um, so, so you thought legal profession was stressful. stressful. <laughs> yeah, no, <laughs> and now you've just sort of out no. of the frying pan into the, uh, yeah, into the cake van. Mm, yeah, not quite <laughs> done it right. Exactly. Yeah. So um, we've talked about the business. Is it is it a real business? I mean, that sounds an awful thing to say, but is it something that you can make enough money on? To, to really sort of replace the employment that you had before? Not yet. Definitely not yet. Um, but then that I don't know if that's partly my responsibility as well because I don't have more hours in the day um, to take it further. Right. But, yeah, definitely, I think, like I said, the foundation is definitely there. Um, I think that was probably, if I think back when I started, where I went wrong, I think pricing has been my most difficult oh, really thing. that's absolutely i think be, when you make things for people that you know it's very hard to um, charge shop tar- prices yeah it is and i think you don't quite realize how time consuming things are until you actually stop and look at how long it took you to do something and uh so i think that's kind of where i went wrong so i viewed it more of a hobby <coughs> than a business yeah. and i yeah. think in hindsight I should have gone in as a business and set, set and the been prices done them. Yes, absolutely. You mentioned freshness. Is that one of the things that sets your cakes apart from other cupcakes? There seem to be a sort of few really cupcake companies that around. look really impressive, but don't necessarily taste nice. And I, so I think that's really important. I must admit, it does worry me when I walk past some of these cake shops and you sort of see the same cake in the window <laughs> yeah. for a couple of days. <laughs> like, sort of think, I'm sure not sure one. about that. Yeah. You know? yeah. <laughs> How long does a cupcake last? Mm. They dry out quite quickly when they're exposed. So, yeah. I mean, probably I'd say a few days maximum. And do you have any, uh, you know, special cupcakes? One of my friends is um, has a big problem with gluten. And uh, it, honestly, sometimes when she sort of offers her biscuits round, you sort of wonder why she bothers because they, they just uh, taste like cardboard. cardboard. <laughs> they're just dreadful. I have been asked to make gluten-free and dairy-free. That was probably my biggest. Gluten I can actually handle. But dairy-free I found really difficult mm. um, because of the buttercream frosting and things like that. I'm like, well, where do I go from there? But um, apparently it tasted really good. So oh, well, he didn't was none the wiser. So, but they do have a lot more products on the market now to kind yeah. of so to, to bake with. Yeah. So how long does it take to, that, that beautiful box of, of six, and they're all mine, no, no, <laughs> no, 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 of six cupcakes, how long would it have taken you to produce those, and, and sort of what would the rough cost of that be? For just those six? I mean, that's a problem, you can't you, just make no. six, so, so you probably, you, there's... Well, you didn't make them two. specially for us. <laughs> no, I did, but there's just a lot <laughs> left over, I'm afraid, <laughs> which is probably good for my children. So you make them into a big batch. Yeah, yeah, so a batch probably makes two dozen. Right, OK. So there's a lot more waiting for me at home. <laughs> so, how, But how much would a box of six cost me? Uh, that size, that would be £12. That's incredibly cheap, really. <laughs> I know, you know, looking at the quality, I, I think you have great with you. <laughs> but the, I mean, the quality of the, these cakes are absolutely beautiful, um, listeners. That uh, you know, chocolate cake with white sort of frosted icing that's piped in the shape of a rose with with sort of sprinkled glitter, things yeah. glitter on top. Yeah. I mean, they, I, I feel like <laughs> you know, we sort of. It's, I feel as though it's our birthday today. <laughs> yeah. The business shows birthday. <laughs> Twelve pounds. That's phenomenal. Yeah. I mean, so it's two to two pounds each. Yeah. You've got that's Joanna Warris now. She thinks she sold a bargain. I know. And <laughs> well, I, I, I certainly, I would certainly pay twelve pounds for them. They're, they're absolutely beautiful. Um, so the ne- the next growth phase possibly could be your own kitchen. What about the next phase in cakes? Is it is it a style? You said that you talked about corporate cakes and things like that. Uh, you know, of, of for me personally, or a cakes well, in general? either either. I mean, I was reading an article recently that um, everything miniature is, is taking off. So I think, again, it's that appeal of that handheld yeah, yeah. and daintier. But then I have to say, it's much more difficult to do things small. small. Yeah, it's like sort of canapes or those sorts yeah, of so things. Yes, so they're misleading. They, may, they look significantly yeah. less cake, which they yeah. are, but yeah. the time Taken. involved yeah. was probably Well, I'm guessing that the icing is, is one of the big time-consuming yes. elements and the decoration. Yes, it is so bad. Yeah, the baking even, actually isn't yeah. that bad. Yeah. But then yeah. you have to factor in, you can bake, but then you have to wait for it to cool down. So even that's a few hours. Okay. Well, thank you so much for coming along. Thank you very really, much Really, really pleased that you're, you're um, going to join the panel with 
Claire and Trevor later. Thank you so much for bringing the cakes. We will be inviting you back, Thank probably you. around Christmas time. Ooh. Well, what, what, <laughs> actually, Mince pies. Actually, 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 next week. Now you've, oh, no. brought, now you've brought that, that in. I'm, I'm, I'd say the sooner the better, actually. <laughs> <laughs> Weekly occurrence. So, Joanna, please uh, th- just tell everybody the uh, address of your website so that uh, you can see these gorgeous cakes and those oh, very, yes. very happy children. <laughs> yes, exactly. It's www dot justpuddings.co.uk Thank you ever so much Joanna McGleedies of Just Puddings The Solid Gold Music Show is here on Radio Verulam 92.6 FM every Saturday morning at 9am Join Derek Staines and Stephen Hall for the music and news as they flash you back to decades past between 9 and 10. Yesterday Today updates the news on your favourite stars of yesterday. Or how about one of your children's favourites in Kids Corner just after 11 o'clock. Take part in competitions where we give away CDs, DVDs and vouchers which can be spent in your local stores. Make sure you don't miss out on Stephen's now legendary gripe just before the midday news. The Solid Gold Music Show is sponsored by Dock Guard of Luton and we'll be back on Radio Verulam this Saturday between 9am and 1pm. If you want to get in touch with the business on Radio Verulam, phone us on 01727 839 926 or email thebusiness at radioverulam.com. Well, we love to get down to the nuts and bolts of things on this show. Um, and so we're on the subject of websites. Your website may be absolutely fantastic, but your buyers need to know it's there in the first place. Um, otherwise, what's, what's the point? So this week, we're looking at this uh, term that many people have heard of, but not that many people understand, called search engine optimization. how to make the most of it. Last week, I met Tom Jepson, um, head of uh, SEO, as it's called, at High Position at the Business Show in Excel in London. And afterwards, I got him on the phone, and apologies with a slight crackle on the line here. I asked Tom, uh, why is search engine optimization um, so important? Um, I think search engine optimization is, is a massively important thing for any business, really. Um, many businesses out there have websites. Um, I think some businesses are sometimes guilty of having a kind of tick list, like I've got my website and that's done, I've done that thing. But I mean, when you consider the fact that you've got a website and you need people to find you and you can have the best website in the world but if, if people can't find you then you're not going to um, get the results that you need um, and with search engines in general I mean it's, it's believed that around 93% of all online activity starts with a search engine so right. it's a massive medium for the people to potentially promote their, their business and in the organic side of things you've got that element of trust as well you can pay to appear in Google, but what people find is that roughly about 70 to 90 percent of people will actually click the organic results. Right. There's yeah. got to be some element of of trust in you know Google actually returning your your website as the most relevant um, in its search results. Right. right. I mean, just just um, to take a step back for a moment, just in simple terms. I mean, I know a lot of people are. are I know that they need to do something about you know uh, optimizing their search results, but but how does it how does it work? Um, well, it's a combination of two key main areas, really. Um, you've got the content side of things, the things that um, are on your website, so the site itself, making sure that it's um, accessible to search engines. The content there is relevant and in context to the queries that you know people are looking for. Um, and then, really, you've got this off. Um, site area, which looks into the other signals um, from elsewhere within the web that give you kind of a, a stamp of credibility or, you know, almost like a vote. And that can come in the form of people linking to you or people making a citation of your brand or through various other new signals such as um, engagement factors and social signals and, and things like that. Right. And interestingly, you use the word context there. So you can't just kind of kid Google along a bit by, by, by just using your your keywords uh, a lot there's a bit more to it than that yeah there is there is i mean in the past um uh, change and optimization was is a very different uh thing and a very different approach to it um there were ways that people would just put a lot of repetition of particular keywords on their pages and that would be enough for google to kind of think yeah this is relevant to a particular topic or particular phrase because it's mentioned so many times but it soon came apparent that people could influence that and you know you'd 
to get the wrong sites coming to the uh, to the top of search results, which ultimately affects the quality of Google's product and service, and therefore they do what they can to kind of filter out sites that try and trick or try and do things that, you know, are there for search engines rather than the, the user's uh, interest, really. So is it, is it fair to say that we're moving into a sort of quality era, um, on from a, a quantity era, or was that always a misunderstanding? No, it's, it's, it's definitely the case. Um, I think uh, a lot of people in the past have been quite guilty of, of thinking about writing content um, for a search engine, like I mentioned, thinking about the keywords and yeah. how many times you mention them on page, um, which is a very kind of old school approach. I think nowadays people need to think much more and really focus on the user and their needs and the quality of that rather than writing a large number of pages that are don't really have much use is better to invest your time into creating something that has you know real value real benefit to those um, that, are, that are reading it really so I mean and perhaps that's you know as it as it should be really isn't it that whether you know, what you do actually engages the um, the audience that you're you're talking to absolutely and, and ultimately like I said earlier Google's trying to res return the best results for their searches if they fail at doing that then users move on to someone another search engine or somebody else and we've seen other search engines go Google's a massive force of nature online but you know if they don't provide quality search results or keep up to date with the needs of the user then yeah. you know, they, they potentially uh, could run themselves into trouble so yeah. you know, it, it, they've always been an advocate of share great content share great things yeah. um, and will we'll kind of boost you for that and give you benefits and, and you know that's what you've got to do nowadays otherwise you run the risk of if you try and if you're trying to cheat the system then you could do permanent damage of uh, to your brand or, or the website's vis visibility online and that was uh, Tom Jempson, uh, uh, head of SEO High Position, um, who I met at the business show in Excel last week. Um, just a quick word um, on his website, which is www.highposition.com. He's also on Twitter um, at High Position SEO. So uh, wonderful to have uh, Tom on the show um, earlier on. And of course, there's our Twitter um, site as well, which is uh, our Twitter address, which is at RV The Business. So please do get in touch. Many people have already uh, with their views and observations uh, through the week and also, of course, during uh, the show. We always love to get your feedback and love to hear about what your events are that are coming up. We've picked up a few of those from Twitter, which we'll be talking about a little bit later on. Um, and after this, we've got our, um, our panel discussion on all manner of subjects after these announcements. <laughs> Join Simon Carver on Fridays from 6.30pm for The Film Guide. We look at the UK Cinema Box Office Top 10, a selection of the new cinema releases and the best of the week's films on free-to-air TV. That's Fridays from 6.30pm on West Hearts Drive Time with Danny Smith, exclusively on Radio Varulam 92.6 FM. You're listening to The Business on Radio Verulam. We're the voice of the local business community on 92.6 FM and on radioverulam.com. Welcome back to The Business. It's uh, 26 minutes to, uh, to, to, to nine, so just over halfway through our show. Uh, now we're getting to our um, panel discussion. I'm delighted to say that in the studio with me I have uh, Claire McAnulty from Compact Video. Hello, Claire. Hi there. And I've got Alex Schubert um, uh, from Winter. Hello. Hello. Hello, and we've got uh, Joanna Michaelidis um, back with us. Um, and uh, have you, um, ladies, have you had any of the puddings yet? I mean, there's anything. Uh... <laughs> we have actually been very um, restrained, Trevor, and we've, we've left them. We've left them till after the programme, so right. don't worry. Well, I mean, it is Father's Day after all. And I, I, think I, should, I, think, I think I should I should remind you just uh, just on that a bit of an emotional blackmail never goes amiss. Um, First subject I wanted to talk to you about um, was a survey I saw that uh, astonished me. Um, a lack of belief and connection to the bottom line are two of the barriers stopping some CEOs, quotes, engaging with engagement. According to research published today by Ashridge Business School, our, um, very, um, our, our good friends over there, over in, um, in uh, near Berkhamsted, um, it goes on to say limited emotional connections such as being open to feedback and sharing power were also cited at as reasons. The research is called Engagement Through CEO Eyes. 
explored this topic with in-depth analysis from 16 CEOs and it revealed that there might be a lack of leadership capability, particularly around emotional intelligence and authenticity, as well as a lack of trust in leadership. Well, goodness me, this this, this term engagement has been around uh, a, a while. So, you know, Claire, is it is it a bunch of fluffy nonsense or, or is it is it route one to profitability? I think you've got to be quite confident as a boss to to accept lots and lots of points of view. Yeah. And and I think that's probably where a lot of people, um, particularly with the older older fashioned companies who very much had a boss who was in charge, who wasn't questioned, and then everybody else underneath. So I think to be the type of boss that works nowadays, um, you, you do need a lot of self-confidence. And um, I think that's maybe a bit where the stumbling block is. Yeah. Uh, what do you think, Alex? Um, well, it's interesting, like you're saying, this concept of employee engagement has been around for quite a long time. And um, what struck me, and I've actually got an HR background, so one of the things, you know, from studying it and things and, um, you know, talking to companies that I've always been on about is this uh, this thing about, you know, how do you get um, employees more engaged and um, motivated and feeling that they're involved in what's going on and all that kind of thing. Um, and, but what struck me when I looked at it is I thought, well, what, what does that mean? What does engagement really mean, actually? And, um, I mean, presumably the way that they've measured this, you know, how, you know, the only way you can measure um, engagement is by asking people, you know, how engaged do you feel yeah. in the organisation? So it's quite a difficult, you know, thing to measure, really. And I just wondered whether the root of it is that um, the the word engagement to, you know, these, these CEOs who've got all these different things on the, th- you know, on the table that they're, they're juggling is just not, you know the word's not engaging yeah really. and yeah. I, because it, it because actually does it really matter to them yeah. how engaged their staff are yeah. it matters to them how productive their staff are yeah and you know the process of you know of encouraging engagement is just sort of part you know part of that process of of getting people to be more productive yeah and and, um, and joanna it, i mean it's it's not a, f- a friendly word i mean it's a, it is a, a friendly term but but it's not it's it's difficult to to to, to put your your fingers on it really it's like a bit of well blum, you know sort of blamange really <laughs> isn't it sorry it's, um, but it's surely it's also time consuming yeah. for them um i think they're under pressure and they're time is precious and i think that to be involved at that level mm. is a massive time commitment yeah yeah, but why? I mean, even if we we struggle with the the term and the definition of it, I mean, are we not? I mean, do we not all instinctively feel that you know, if you're happy, if you're if you're into what you're doing, surely that must must make a difference, Claire. Of course, but but I suppose if if you're running a big company, you've got hundred and one other things to think about, then it probably falls down towards the bottom of your list as long as. Um, you know what what um, Joanna and um, Alex are saying, which is you've got so many other things to do that perhaps as long as as long as people are doing the job, hmm. you're not too concerned. You're not too concerned about how they're feeling about it. Yeah, yeah. Any other thoughts on that? Um, I think there's it's sometimes difficult um, to get the balance between making people feel. Um, that they're part of the organisation, they're part of the decision-making process, they've got a voice, and yeah. and confusing that with it being, you know, a democracy, you mm. know, it obviously isn't, you know, mm. so it's quite difficult to get that balance where, you know, right, let's have a group, we'll all talk about, because ultimately, you know, you that, that individual doesn't, you know, isn't going to really influence yeah. the decision. So yeah. that can be a little bit tricky sometimes, and I think sometimes people feel like, oh, Am I just, you know, a CEO might feel, well, I'm just going through the most, you know, I'm just, it's, I'm, it's a bit fake, really. Am I just, we've already decided what, you know, we've had our board meeting, we've decided what we're going to so, do. So we thought we'd patronise you a bit. Yeah, so, so we thought, oh, <laughs> you know, how do you feel about, yeah, it, yeah. I, I wonder whether that's I, a bit tricky That's sometimes. really, that's a really good point, because I, because, you know, we've been through this in various stages, haven't we, that, that, um, that there was this, you know, back in the old, old days, you know, you might call your, your boss sir or something, you know, and, and then you stop calling them sir. But, of course, that didn't matter because, because everybody knew who the boss was anyway and it didn't actually change the, the power structure. And maybe, I mean, maybe engagement is, is you know, it, it, you're right, it's not, a, it's not a democracy, is it? It's, uh, it's just, it, it, perhaps we shouldn't pretend, perhaps we should all be a bit 
a bit firmer about these things. Although I think I think people have had to learn to become more so because of social media. You know, when social yeah. media very much is the, the customers putting their points of view and yeah. they expect to be heard and they expect to be some response to be given to them. Yeah. So it has it has gone slightly more that way. Yeah, yeah. So that's good. I mean, because you, you're actually providing me the fantastic link into our next. <laughs> <laughs> it's almost I, like we rehearsed it. Yeah. <laughs> if only we had. <laughs> uh, into, into, so shall, I, shall, I, shall, I, shall we move on to that, perhaps? And um, I, I, I think we all hear how important it is to be into social media. And we, you know, we're being told all the time that we need to be on Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn, Google Plus, and, and various other things. I mean, but. but um, I saw a piece in uh, the Huffington Post uh, this week which actually said, did you ever consider that aspects might actually be hurting your business? Um, and the, the piece goes on to say, a number of productivity experts have commented on the idea that we live in busyness, uh, B-U-S-Y-N-E-S-S, meaning that we feel we are busy because we continually enmesh ourselves in doing things for the sake of doing them without being uh, uh, cognizant of the actual result. We feel that uh, the piece says we have to be on social media, so we are, often to our own detriment. And then it quotes a couple of numbers saying, according to empowerednetwork.com, 22% of time spent online is spent on social networking. People spent twice as much time on Facebook than they did on exercising. Um, the average user spends 24 hours a month on a social networking site. And also the research related to student productivity is alarming as well. Leaving aside the students for a minute and getting back to business, Come on, should we all be honest? Should we all own up? Is it affecting our productivity or is it, is it a great enabler? Um, jo- Joanna, what do, you, what do you think? Certainly in my business, I actually found it was massively time-consuming trying to keep up to date with Twitter and Facebook and Pinterest and, and I'm not sure the returns were worth it. Right. Um, so, right. yeah, I would definitely agree with... So, so what is worth it instead? I mean, what, what, doing, doing what actually sort of makes the, makes the cake orders come in? <laughs> Probably making more, <laughs> just, just getting people <laughs> to try them. Cakes. Yeah, I mean, yeah. genuinely. Um, but, but you've got to try all these things. I think that's the thing. They are free. They are available to you. They're easy. Um, so you've got to try these things and find out what works and what doesn't work. And for me, it's certainly like having a website and Facebook page is very good for referencing. Um, I, re- I refer people to look at the photos and things, and then they go from there and order. But I don't think I would have necessarily got business just from that. I think as well that different social networks work better for for different businesses, you know. So, for example, I would imagine for cakes, because they're so beautiful and they're so visual, that something like pin and dress probably would work very well for you, but maybe not for someone like me or, you know, someone with a different sort of business. But I think the thing is that we all feel this pressure that we should be doing all of them, you know, we should be doing everything from Facebook to LinkedIn and whatever. I I certainly feel that too. Alex? Mm. I mean, what I say to my clients is that, you know, it's really important anybody running a business these days that you understand social media, you understand how it can be used, but you may decide that not, like you say, not everything suits your business. Um, And I think the really key thing is to remember that you need to think about it as part of your overall marketing strategy. What are you trying to do? Who are you trying to talk to? And what are you trying to say? And what do you want them to do? Yeah. It really is a waste of time if you just think, oh, well, I better just go on, you know, go on, create a profile type stuff. You know, it's got to be part of that. Um, yeah. Yeah. I, I, to me, I, when I get kind of confused and bewildered by things like social media, I try and find some simple way of understanding it, which I think I think is what you're all what you're all saying, really, is, is that what is the business rationale for for it? And for me. There's, you know, there's lots of vehicles, but there's there's probably just two or three refreshingly simple questions that you need to ask yourself, I suppose, which is, where are my buyers? And if they don't use your social media, then don't use social media, you mm-hmm. know, in what in what you're you're doing. And if they, um, you know, and then you know, what do they want? Actually, social media is for me in my business, you know, is is a good research tool of actually finding stuff out quite quite quickly. And then I suppose the final question is, um, why should they buy from me rather than rather than anybody else? And then everything else. Is fluff really, and uh, and uh, you know it's nice to have lots of you know lots of Twitter followers, but actually, does that matter? Does it make the the uh, the, the 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 cash tills ring? And uh, if it does, then great, you know. But um, but if not, then uh, then 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 you know then then maybe uh, maybe not. What do you each of you use most of all, though? Are you sort of Facebookers, uh, tweeters? 
LinkedIn yeah, I, is. There's nothing good. To, you can't say LinkedIn is in a nice yeah. way, can you? It doesn't sound right, does it? I, I <laughs> would say my, my best ones are LinkedIn and Twitter. Those are my two. I don't tend to use Facebook and I don't tend to use Pinterest, but I've been thinking about using it. But those those are my two that work for me. I've had work from both of those, so that's why I know they, they, they do work. Well, I'd say mine are the opposite, <laughs> Facebook really? and Pinterest. Again, probably because of the visual element. Yeah. Um, I mean, although I do put photos on Twitter, it's not quite the same for me anyway. Mm. Right, mm. right. Alex? I know when to use his Twitter quite a lot. I know that there, there'll be some things on this evening about the, you know, the, this radio show and things. So they're oh, quite yes. good on, um, yes. they're quite good on Twitter. Your, your guys really are good, aren't they? They are, they, aren't they? They, 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 they just read. They, they, they do in the build up yeah. in the in the times I'm just saying this in case you're listening <laughs> so yeah. went, to, went to people so um, yeah, yeah it did occur to me it. Yeah. it did occur to me actually that of course you can I think you can you can time things because I was thinking all oh, the marketing people working on a on a Sunday night <laughs> and I thought oh no perhaps they've you know set them up in advance of course you can do I things know, like that so. I think they are sneaking in live actually because they're retweeting some of the things that they didn't Ooh, know that we were going to well, post so, well done yeah. well done went yes, to marketing so a, feather, a feather in their cap um <laughs> I think, you know, when it comes down to it, you know, I think what we're all saying is that there are bits of it. You could easily be distracted, you know, if you're not too careful. Um, but but actually, as long as you're, you're focused on, like anything really, as long as you're focused on, on what your business wants, then 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 everything else follows from that. So the, the tail shouldn't wag the dog on uh, on social social media. Is that is that a fair summary, do you think? Mm, definitely. Yeah. And, and, uh, okay, well, what we'll do is thank you very much for that, um, uh, Alex uh, from, from Wenter, uh, Joanna from uh, Just Puddings, and, uh, and Claire from Compact Video. Now, what I'm going to go and do now is that we like to have all our um, best, um, best practice, top tips, and so on. And you'll remember that we had um, Mike um, um, Dilk in the, uh, in the studio from the chair company uh, a few weeks ago. And, uh, and at the t- time, we like to get the best out of our, our, our guests. So we asked him um, all about um, his um, top tips, best and worst decisions. And, uh, and this is what he said. I think the best decision in, in business that I made um, was really about the type of business to, to start up. Because I my... Um, business ideas morphed quite a few times before I kind of hit with what I'm doing, which I think is quite common. And I think business plans also morph quite a lot during the, the life of a, a business. And my initial business plan was to uh, sell some yoga products, which I developed in a sort of a retail fashion and bring in other products as well. I'd done yoga for 15 years, but actually to do yoga, you don't need very much. You need a mat and maybe a cushion. You can have some other things as well. But in my view, to have a, a retail business selling things for yoga, you end up selling a load of things that you don't really need. And I, I didn't want to do that. I wanted to sell things that people found useful. So my idea morphed into helping people with bad backs. Um, and I was researching products for that. I came across the back app chair. Um, and I thought this was something really good and I'd like to include that. So I spoke to the manufacturer and one thing led to another and I kind of describe it as talking myself into trouble because now I'm the UK distributor of the of of the back app chair. And what would you say that your worst decision has been if if worst is is the right word to use? Do you know I've been really lucky so far admittedly I'm quite a young business I've only been going a year and a half but I don't think I've, and this is not, I'm not trying to blow my own trumpet here, I think this is more through luck than judgment. I don't think I've really gone down any hideous blind alleys. I haven't dealt with someone who's turned out to be a crook yet. I haven't got an example. I think the, the example that I, I can just say is you know, wasting uh, a few long trips uh, to, to Manchester or even slightly further afield with someone who then didn't become... Uh, a retailer. So was there a light bulb moment? I can remember the light bulb moment actually. I was in St Pancras station and I was talking to uh, a guy from Back App who was showing me the chair and at that time I was thinking of just including it as part of my retail offering. And while we were, talk- we were having a coffee and we were chatting, he was showing me the chair and I was ex- uh, explaining to him some of the yoga things I'd developed and thought about. And it slowly dawned on me, hang on a moment, why don't I just suggest to this man 
that I become the distributor in the UK for this chair. And it was a, a specific kind of 30 seconds. I can remember it entering into my head. So I, I asked him, and he said, yeah, OK, we'll consider that. We'll take that further. So it, it took a, a, a little bit of negotiation. I, I had a trip to Norway to go and talk to the inventor. Um, but fairly soon, it sort of came to pass. It came to pass, says Mike uh, Dilk from the, uh, the 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 chair company. He was uh, he was very interesting. You heard the dulcet tones of uh, of Claire McAnulty interviewing. He's with us still in the uh, in the studio and uh, and folk at the Hearts Business Awards um, heard your dulcet tones as well, along with uh, Vicky the other day. Yeah, that's right. We went uh, we went along to the launch. So this is the Hertfordshire Business Awards held every year, and we were quite interested really to hear not only the the, the range of the awards, but actually what results the awards had had for the various businesses and um, I was particularly interested in these two girls because they're sisters and they run a company called Smart 10 and they won the award last year, the Judges Award and um, I asked them how the awards had affected their business. It was amazing for us because we were finalists for Best New Business. Um, we unfortunately didn't quite win that one, but we ended up winning the overall Judges Award, which was, we like to think anyway, the most prestigious award of the evening, um, which all the judges uh, just voted on the most promising and innovative company. But by winning that award, we won £10,000 worth of advertising, which has been phenomenal, phenomenal publicity and marketing for us. Um, we've been advertising quite frequently in the Well and Hatful Times and all the Archer newspapers. But also, by winning the award, we got lots of free publicity through newspaper articles and press releases and everything. You're both sisters, and I'm quite interested that you came back from Dubai and set up the company together with your sister. Have, have you worked before together? No, this is the first experience we've had um, at working together. Emma was at a stage where she was wondering what to do um, when she returned from Dubai. And having worked with the same business before, coming from a similar background, we decided that why not utilise our strengths within the recruitment industry and our knowledge within the local area to, to work together, really. But it's been a great experience, hasn't it, Emma? It's been great, challenging at times, admittedly, because um, you do have to learn to be business partners as opposed to sisters. So we're, we're adapting and learning how to work together. But no, it's great fun. It's nice. We both are very different, have lots of different strengths. So as well as it can be challenging, we've learned throughout the year how to work together and, and utilise each other's strong points, I suppose. When you were starting, how did you get your work when you first started? I'd been out the area for four years, so Claire was continued working in recruitment and she was very well established in the industry, so she had some business to bring over automatically, but um, when I first came back, my focus was to generate new business, so it, again, we did it through brand awareness, strong marketing campaigns, and this business award has really helped us you know, establish our brand and develop the business. You said it was within, uh, within a year you had five employees. Now, how did, how did that come about? It was quite nerve-wracking when we got to hire our first recruit, as it always is, and then it just comes, you know, naturally to sort of expand again once we were busy. There's a team of five now. We all get them very well, and I think, you know, we do recognise the fact that you're only as successful as your team. We're really pleased with success to date and we have complimented each other but you know we'll both admit it has been a bit trial and error initially but no we, we've worked to it and it, it's, it's good fun now. It's good fun now she said and uh, it sounds like it was good fun. Yeah, and, and I mean, those two girls have done brilliantly. They, they hadn't even been in business a year when they applied for that award. Yeah. And, um, yeah, no, the pair of them are great and they're already expanding their business. They've already got five employees. So it was, it was a really interesting event, wasn't it? You know, and I think Archant should be uh, celebrated for having um, been run it, running it. I think they're saying something like 17 years or possibly even longer. Really? So, okay. so we, we actually interviewed quite a few people um, at the event and, um, and got some very different takes on the, on, on the whole show so we'll be following that up in, in a few weeks time and um, uh, you know looking at other companies that ought to be thinking about entering. Yes and on that subject we're hoping in uh, a couple of weeks time next week uh, we're not on air because we're, it's the um, Sir Dalton's uh, out, uh, street party outside broadcast but the following week we will be back and we'll have a bit of an award special won't we we're, we'll be talking a bit more about these awards that you've just been to but also the retailer of the year yes, um, awards yes, which are taking right. place it's actually we could say it's the first of our diary events for for the for yes. this evening <laughs> my links are getting smoother <laughs> um and um that's taking place on monday the 24th 
of uh, June and we'll be there um, so do come and say hello and uh, and uh, why not tweet to us about it about uh, about your hopes and fears your excitement at winning or uh, whether you thought it was a good evening or not at RV the business so that's the first of our items but Vicky you've got a few as well well it you? seems that uh, Tuesday next week is the very very big day for networking or right. very, so we've got um, 10 till 12 you've got business buzz in <coughs> Watford that's at the Palace Theatre ah. Watford um, are also on Tuesday breakfast for the very early birds the seven seven till nine you've got 24 7 networking group meeting at the Mercure Hotel in Watford and also on Tuesday you could actually could go from breakfast to mid to mid morning coffee and then go if, only if you're female I'm afraid to lunch with the women in business network um, that's St Albans Central group that are also meeting on uh, Tuesday June the 18th they meet between 12 and 2 at the Ardmore House Hotel uh, that's the Women in Business Network. So all th- you could network your way through Tuesday <laughs> if you'd like to. Right, and, um, and, and, and why not? I mean, uh, you should go, I mean, because it, it does bring in, in, in the business I- I itself. I've got one here um, being held by the uh, School of Education at the University of Hertfordshire and uh, Hearts for Learning. Um, uh, are, are delighted, they say, to offer you some well-deserved thinking space on July the 10th and 11th. They say the chance to join us for a half day of leadership inspiration with some of the UK's leading thinkers and practitioners from the worlds of psychology, business and academia. Um, I think it sort of runs under the banner of sort of invigorating thinking for today's uh, leaders. As aspiring leaders, it says so much of what you do is about inspiring others, from teams of teachers to classrooms of pupils. The prospect of firing so many imaginations is immensely exciting but also hugely challenging sounds uh, really interesting it though. does yes and uh well worth they run some very good events there it's uh, it's 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 well worth it now um uh, when we were having our debate um particularly around sort of social um networking um i i, I sensed somehow that vicky <laughs> might want to sort of chime in on this, uh, on this debate she didn't get she didn't she wasn't on mic at that time but you've got you've got about a minute vicky, oh, to, to, to 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 spill your guts what, what do you think about well, you know, I think what what was said was is, you know is perfectly reasonable. Um, I, I think what people tend to do is they they sort of do a little bit of dabbling and then they sort of think, oh gosh, I'm 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 not really getting any business from this. It's not really working. I'm wasting my time. I'm sort of going to move on. And actually, it's like all marketing. If you've got plans and you've got objectives and you allocate an amount of time, then very very few of these mechanisms for supporting your business um, won't work. Yeah. But you've got to have that plan. You've got to know what you're trying to achieve so do you mean a sort of regular drum beat you just have to keep at it you, ha- and, you have yeah. you've got to, but you've got to know what it is you're trying to achieve you can't just go on there and sort of say oh you know i'm, I'm just about to bake a cake it's well, you well know, jo- that's jo- not, joanna can well I mean. joanna if joanna <laughs> went on and said i'm just about to um bake uh, you know a, a rosby sponge for um you know the, the head of the rosby association because they've got such, you know then people then maybe the head of the strawberry association might think oh that sounds like an interesting thing and that's how those sorts of things work but you have to have you know, very very clear objectives you know have to know your voice you have to know who it is you're wanting to talk to and what it is you're trying to achieve because i think you said trevor uh, you know just having a million twitter uh, twitter uh, followers is of no value whatsoever what you need is engagement absolutely and on that bombshell we finish our show thank you to claire thank you to vicky thank you to joe and alex um, and thank, thank you, you to trevor and thank, <laughs> thank you all listening to the business on radio verulam if there's anything in the show you want to talk to us about phone us on 01727 839 926 or email the business at radioverulam.com